to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. My name is Shriya Singh and in today's episode, we go to Africa where Ebola has returned after 10 years to Uganda. Meanwhile, the US Vice President has visited the Korean Peninsula, sparking a lot of discussion and some tensions. And staying on with the US, prisoners in the state of Alabama are on strike. We'll talk about this and more in today's episode. Nearly 10 years after its last appearance, there is a fresh outbreak of Ebola disease in Uganda. Health authorities have confirmed 31 cases in the latest count, though these are only the official numbers. Unlike previous outbreaks of Ebola in Uganda, recent cases have been linked to the Sudan virus strain. What is of concern is that there is no approved vaccine for this strain of the virus. Health workers at the Mumbai Regional Hospital, at the, that is the epicentre of the out outbreak, went on a strike citing safety concerns. They say they are being put at undue risk because they lack appropriate safety kit, risk allowances and health insurance. We joined by Anna from People's Health Movement uh, to update more on this story. Thank you for joining us, Anna. Can you tell us why is this outbreak so serious? And can you also tell us a little bit about what are the steps that Uganda's authorities are taking when, when dealing with this? Uh, yes, of course. So um, the outbreak is significant because it involves a different uh, strain of the virus that uh, we're used to see uh, when Ebola is concerned. So um, the uh, the outbreak that uh, Ugandan health authorities uh, have announced uh, on uh, 20 September September uh, is caused by the uh, by the Sudan's uh, strain of the virus, uh, and uh, on so. This is important because it's uh, the first outbreak caused by this strain uh, in Uganda since 2012. So, you know, we've seen 10, 10 years of, uh, of outbreaks caused by, by other strains. Uh, and then in addition to that, we see that the mortality, the fatality uh, of, um, of this strain of uh, the virus is somewhat higher than compared to, uh, to the others. And so in previous outbreaks, uh, which have been caused by the Sudan strain of the virus in Sudan and Uganda, uh, was somewhere between 40 and 100 percent. So, you know, uh, if, if the situation is not contained in, a, in, a, in an adequate manner, uh, uh, many, many lives could be lost. And then uh, then again, because it's... Uh, it's rarer than the other uh, the other strains. We also see that it's uh, more complicated to diagnose uh, and to recognize uh, among patients. And so, um, it, you know, it uh, it requires quite a bit of diagnostics behind it. So different uh, and multiple methods of the diagnostics, uh, and it can also be. Uh, either confused or mistaken for uh, manifestations of other diseases which we can encounter, so for example, malaria. And then finally, uh, what's so important is that um, although there are Ebola vaccines currently, uh, they uh, are not considered effective for this strain of the virus. Uh, and this is because uh, although some, some of the vaccines have been de developed having in mind that another outbreak of the Sudan, uh, Sudan strain could uh, come up, uh, their efficiency hasn't been actually tested. So uh, we do know that, uh, you know, even if they were effective, uh, and this is not, not completely clear, they have to be administered in two doses and they only uh, raise their, uh, so they become the most effective only days after the administration of the second dose. So it's not completely uh, well, it's not something that uh, you would do in an outbreak situation where you need uh, to act very quickly. Uh, and so because of all these things, the WHO and the public health authorities in Uganda are pu putting a lot, uh, of, uh, in, uh, a lot of effort into raising community engagement uh, and just uh, sharing information about the public health measures that, uh, that can control the outbreak at the moment. Anna, I mean, like you pointed out, the mortality is so high. There are so many risks with this particular strain. And the health workers who are coming in, you know, contact with the patients right now in Uganda, they are also at risk. So we talked about how there's a strike going on by the medical, work, medical workers. Can you tell us what, why are they striking and what are the demands? 
Uh, yes, so essentially it's uh, something that has ha has come up as a concern in previous Ebola outbreaks too. Uh, this time uh, it uh, it's the case with interns, uh, so medical doctors, young medical doctors, nurses and pharmacists uh, who are uh, in the central region of Uganda where the outbreak is located. Uh, and they are protesting and they have announced it, industrial action because of a lack of proper uh, protective equipment uh, and bad working conditions that they are facing. So um, their, uh, the, their announcement has been, has been backed by the Uganda Medical Association uh, and the president, uh, Dr. Sam Oledo, uh, said that uh, the authorities should take into consideration that when, uh, when work is expected by health workers in such uh, you know, extreme circumstances, that uh, it has to be taken into account that their working conditions, their protection, their salaries uh, have to, uh, you know, they have to be taken into account essentially. And he also pointed out that this hasn't been always the case in the past. So for example, um, he quoted the COVID-19 pandemic as something where uh, no adequate remuneration was offered to the health workers who were expected to take, in, uh, to take an extra workload uh, and to work in uh, very precarious and quite dangerous circumstances. Mm. What's important to point out here is that this situation faced at the moment has a lot to do with the overall conditions uh, and the shortage of health workers in Uganda. So um, the, the country itself uh, has been uh, struggling with the shortage of health workers for years. So it's not something that only affects uh, the Ebola outbreak or it affects the COVID-19 pandemic. It also affects how the health system overall functions. Uh, and um, it has also a lot to do with how the health system, uh, the public health system is financed and how, many, uh, how much money uh, the government is, uh, let's put it that way, allowed to put into the, into the public health system. And um, research, which was done by ActionAid and Public Services International, uh, among others, uh, which was published only at the end of last year, showed that actually the Ugandan health system has been um, limited and has been affected by the implementation of austerity measures, which were imposed by the International Monetary Fund. And so uh, this, um, this set of conditions that was pushed upon by, uh, by international financial institutions in the, can, uh, in the case of Uganda, uh, they involved uh, a freeze of wages and therefore also impacting the, the, health the, the working conditions and uh, the possibility that the health workers have to sustain themselves. Uh, so at the end of 2020, or some, sometime in, the uh, in 2020, uh, Uganda did try to get uh, you know, permission let's put it again that way, uh, to take on more health workers um, because they quoted that they only had approximately seven health workers for uh, approximately 10,000 people when the recommended, uh, recommended ratios would be a minimum of 4.45. Uh, so it's a big gap. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, even in spite of this quite, uh, quite, uh, mm, quite bad situation, the IMF uh, insisted on, on freezing the wages and not actually putting uh, more money in, in the public health system. Uh, and so, as I said, this is uh, something that if it continues, it's likely to affect and to continue affecting the overall functioning of the health system uh, and therefore also the ability of the health system to respond to, to the Ebola outbreak. Thank you so much for your time today, Anna. We'll keep following this very important story. Thank you once again. Thanks. In our second story, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris was recently on a four-day Asia trip to attend the state funeral of the former Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. Her trip to South Korea was followed by a stop at the demilitarized zone, that's DMZ, where she spoke about the threat posed about the increasingly hostile North. Now, tensions have surged on the peninsula as North Korea fired three short-range ballistic missiles hours after the U.S. Vice President flew home. Anish joins us to discuss more on this important update. Welcome back to the show, Anish. So, a lot of discussion around this visit. Can you tell us what is the significance of this visit? Well, the significance for the United States is to... Uh, it was actually an attempt 
uh, for them to mend relations between Japan and South Korea because these are two nations that they uh, that they have a huge uh, bulk of their foreign uh, foreign based troops in. And also, apart from that, they would need uh, these two nations to be in tandem with the U.S. project of not just encircling North Korea, but also China. So in the larger scheme of things for the U.S., what matters is that its alliance partners are in line with them rather than. But the, prop, uh, the issue, uh, the primary issue between South Korea and Japan has always been uh, the historical crimes that Japan has committed during World War II and uh, before uh, as an imperial power, as a colonizing power on, Korea, on the Korean Peninsula. So these are facts that uh, Japan is yet to own up to. Uh, these are things that the US also does not want South Korea to uh, bring up uh, right now just so that they can actually do what they want with in the region. And so the visit was uh, towards that uh, purpose. Um, but as we saw, the visit also included uh, a, a visit to the demilitarized zone, which uh, included uh, Kamala Harris's speech, very provocative speech being conducted uh, of, uh, uh, of so supposedly unbreakable alliance with the South, with the South Korean government, and also its uh, its uh, you know steadfast support for. Uh, or supposedly said steadfast support for democracy in the region, which often has always come with a lot of baggage, as we have known at around post. Yeah, Anish, so like you who has been covering the region for a while now, can you tell us how can we understand North Korea's reaction to this? And I mean, the tensions, what does it reflect about the tensions within the Koreas itself? Well, it is... Uh, as we've uh, often covered in this show itself, uh, it has often been a problematic thing ever since uh, the Trump uh, administration had scuttled the entire peace process uh, during the time of Moon Jae-in. So now under President Yoon, uh, it has only gone from bad to worse, uh, to the point where a US president, a US vice president, not the US president, but the US vice president can visit the demilitarized zone and make provocative statements that actually pushes peace under the bus. Now, the whole response, apparently, the U.S. is trying to frame it as a response to uh, missile launches that were conducted by North Korea, but North Korea's missile launches were in response to South Korea's plan to have uh, joint military drills with Japan and the U.S. Uh, so that has always been a major issue and has always been a major stumbling block between the two Koreas, uh, or peace between the two Koreas. And that uh, is going to be aggravated now, considering the fact that the current South Korean administration wants to expand the military drills and also into Japan, as it has done now earlier today, where it conducted an anti-submarine, anti, very clearly anti-North Korean uh, military exercises in the West Coast, uh, in the East Coast, I'm sorry. Uh, in the East Coast, and it, that is that, in fact, is just as provocative as the missile launches being conducted. And uh, South Korea's uh, reasoning behind this is that it is trying to prepare for the supposed uh, launch or another test being conducted by North Korea, nuclear test to be conducted by North Korea, which is of uh, just speculative at this point. There is no real, uh, there's no clear. Uh, understanding of whether it is going to be imminent, but at the same time, there has been a, there has been no attempts of brokering peace, uh, be it on the part of the United States, which is a warring party of the still de facto, uh, you know, ongoing Korean War, and uh, and there has been no attempt, uh, obviously, by the current administration to actually make. Uh, or uh, take up uh, actions that can actually facilitate any kind of peace process. So we have to really wait and see. We have been obviously uh, observing a whole lot of escalation that has happened in the past few months that President Yoon has been in power. Now it has, it, uh, in the next four years, we, uh, we do not know how bad it is going to be. And considering his track record of being very uh, anti-North Korean, anti communist uh, uh, proponent in the South Korea, this is only going to get 
from bad to worse. For the United States, however, this is a win-win situation because for them, they get to do what they always wanted, which is to expand its military presence in East Asia and also to do the kind of stuff that Kamala Harris did in the demilitarized zone, which would not have happened in an earlier administration. Thank you so much for that update on this story. We'll keep coming back to you on this. Prisoners across major correctional facilities in Alabama went on a strike on September 26. A statement released by prisoners called it a humanitarian crisis, which has occurred due to antiquated sentencing laws that led to overcrowding, numerous deaths, severe physical injury, as well as the mental anguish to incarcerated individuals. In solidarity with the prisoners, activists and family members of the incarcerated organizers participated in a rally entitled Break Every Chain. Outside the Alabama Department of Corrections, that's ADOC, a headquarters in Montgomery, to demand adoption of the prisoners' demands. Now, although prison officials attempted to dispel news of any pr prison action, reports have confirmed that maintenance work at the prison facilities have come to a halt. Alabama is one of the five states which forces prisoners to work under threat of punishment or no pay, one of the and one of the seven states which does not pay prisoners at all for the vast majority of work assignments. We are joined by Natalia from People's Dispatch to talk more about this story. Welcome to the episode, Natalia. Glad to see you. So, can you tell us why are the prisoners in Alabama, they are on a strike right now? What are their demands exactly? Well, um, it's interesting because there is a work stoppage, you know, one would assume that the demands are around labor conditions for incarcerated workers, but actually they're around sentencing laws in Alabama. So, in Alabama, um, you know, there's mass incarceration in the entire United States, and this is really due to lengthy sentencing for minor crimes. Um, but this is especially true in Alabama because the parole board has become notorious for denying the vast majority of parole applications. Um, so, you know, during the last year, 2021, the state's parole board fell far short of even its own standards for um, granting prisoners parole. And only 15% of eligible prisoners did actually end up getting paroled. Um, and so, you know, prisoners in Alabama are trying to, um, you know, fight the laws that make, uh, you know, people go to prison for a very long time for minor crimes like, you know, marijuana possession. Um, there was recently a um, Black man, Michael Bettis, who has already served 12 years out of a 20 year prison sentence for marijuana possession, and he was denied parole in May. So he will not be released anytime soon. And so, you know, the prisoners in Alabama are saying that, um, you know, this is really an outrage. The fact that um, parole isn't being granted is an outrage. People are already serving really lengthy sentences. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's really the main, those are really the main demands. And uh, you talked about how Alabama is, there's a reason why Alabama is the hotspot for this. Can you also uh, mention why incarcerated labor, what are the conditions that incarcerated labor works in? What are these work conditions that they are protesting? Yeah, so, you know, the United States has become notorious around the world for having, you know, the largest per capita prison population in the world. Um, and also for the fact that um, the workers in prison, you know, a lot of prisons force people to work, as a matter of fact. A lot of these workers are, or almost all of these workers are extremely underpaid, far below the min minimum wage in the US. And some are not even paid at all. And uh, Alabama is actually especially bad because Alabama is one and one in only a few states that actually forces work um, prisoners to work. Um, they don't have a choice in the matter. Um, you know, they can get punished for not working. And also for the vast majority of work assignments, doesn't pay anything at all to incarcerated workers. So a lot of people have compared this to slavery. You know, the um, slavery in the South and in the US is, you know, a well-known historical fact. And a lot of people say that it hasn't ended because the vast majority of these incarcerated workers are black men. Um, and if you even see the visuals from some of these prisons in the deep South in the US, it really looks very much like slavery. You have people, you know, black men stoop down picking cotton, literally just picking cotton, like the same exact crop while, you know, correctional officers are standing over them on horseback. Like, it's an insane visual. Um, and so, you know, this is, the, this is true in Alabama as well. Um, prisoners are not, you know, paid for working. 
And also um, prisoners, you know, the vast majority of work assignments are actually maintaining the prison itself. So doing the cleaning, doing the cooking, just maintaining the prison. That's not something that um, the guards are doing, right? And so this work stoppage really means that the entire prison is being shut down. All right. Thank you so much, Natalia, for that update. We'll keep following this very important news. Thank you for being with us today. And that's all we have for today, dear viewers. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. For more such updates, keep watching www.peoplesdispatch.org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. That's our socials. Thank you so much. Thank you.